Hi, everyone. Oh, sorry, this is really loud. Um, <laughs> welcome to our very first interview of this academic year. And now, as uh, some of you might remember, when Thomas Piketty took the stage here, and he said that financial deregulation is putting our social contract under a serious pressure. Well, now we have another powerful voice in that conversation, um, Professor Guy Standing. Guy Standing is a renowned labor economist and professor of development studies at the University of London. Um, his work made waves with the precariat and a rising social class with unstable working conditions and living conditions, which is also closely tied to the rise of populism. Um, also, he's at the forefront of the Universal Basic Income, uh, co-founder of the Basic uh, Income Earth Network. Um, yeah, and he's worked with numerous pilot projects as well. So today we're diving deep into all of those topics and more. So let's give a warm welcome to social thinker, economist and author Guy Standing. Can I sit over there? Yeah, there. Please. <laughs> I, sit, I sit on the right for once. Yes. Um, <laughs> welcome to our couches. Let's dive right in. Uh, you're labeled as a labor economist. However, your claims stray quite far from what most people learn in their first economics courses. Would you say you're somewhat of a rare bird amongst the economists? Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here and to be the first speaker in your new series. I, I would call myself a, a rebel economist rather than a labor economist. <laughs> and I think that one of the greatest errors of modernity has been to put labor on a pedestal. We suffer from a jobs fetish, that I call it, which I think is something to do with the current crisis. So I wouldn't call myself a, a labor economist, even though my PhD was in labor economics many years ago. OK, uh, before we dive into the specifics, rentier capitalism is central to your work and provides like a global context uh, to your claims. Can you outline what rentier capitalism means to you? Yeah, I think it's very important that we look at the current phase of history as a crisis in the global transformation. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Karl Polanyi's book, The Great Transformation, written in 1944. And if you remember, he basically argued that capitalism evolves through phases of disembeddedness and re-embeddedness. And the disembeddedness for Polanyi and the Great Transformation was in the 19th century when financial capital became the dominant force of capitalism. And as a result, insecurities rose, inequalities rose, and the situation became crisis-prone until, in his words, there was a threat of the annihilation of civilization. And that was in the 1930s with the rise of fascism and Bolshevism and so on. And he said there had to be a re-embeddedness now, the great transformation of Polanyi ran out of steam in the 1970s. The social democratic era, if you like, post-war era, collapsed, essentially. Keynesianism, the welfare state, and it was basically a time of globalization, a time of a new technological revolution, and an economics revolution. And the economics revolution we now talk about neoliberalism, the Chicago School of Law and Economics, the Mont Pelerin Society, and they ushered in a phase of economics which was profoundly different from the economics I learned at Cambridge. And they basically were a bunch of right-wingers who came in to dominate economics. And they said, we would have free markets, individualistic markets, Everything should be free markets. And the irony of history is that as a result of what they did, today we have the most unfree market economy ever envisaged. 
we have a situation of what I called rentier capitalism, in which more and more of the income goes to those who have property. Physical property, financial property, or intellectual property. And we have had a emergence of a state which is subsidizing capital, it's de-risking finance, and we are seeing the functional distribution of income worsen and worsen and worsen all over the world. So in every country, including China, including the United States, including the Netherlands, including Britain, the share of national income going to labor has been going down, the share going to capital is going up, but the share going in forms of rent, that means through command of non-market forces, has been shooting up much faster than mm -hmm. at all. So we have a rentier capitalism which has created this new global class structure that my books are about, and profoundly altered not only the distribution of income, but created chronic economic insecurity for the masses. And that's the premise of my, my work. Yeah, and uh, in one of your books, The Blue Commons, you talk about how finance becomes increasingly dominating. And what you especially criticize is this short-sightedness of global finance. Why does it become visible and problematic in our world? Well, finance, those of you who are studying economics will know this, finance became liberalized in the 1980s. So what we had was not so much deregulation, but a situation of allowing finance to make increasing profits. And it essentially, to use an analogy, it's become the tail that's wagged the dog in the sense that my own country, Britain, mm. financial assets are now worth well over 1,000% of GDP. In the Netherlands, it's 800% of GDP. When I was a student, we would have said, what? You know, flip this, or well, some words to that effect, because we would have said this is totally unacceptable. Okay, and you mentioned the Blue Commons. The Blue Commons is, is about the sea and how we are seeing the commons, which are the sea. We maybe come back to the commons later. Yes. <laughs> and they, they have been financialized. Now, I don't know how many of you Dutch people here know how much area of your country is covered by sea, okay? Well, you, your land area is about 41,000 square kilometers. Your sea area is 154,000 square kilometers. So your sea area is nearly four times as, as much as your land area. In my own country, it's 27 times as much. And growth in the future is expected to come from the blue. Area. So that is an area where finance now is moving in. And you ask me, why, why should we be concerned? Well, finance is dominated today by private equity, all mainly in Wall Street. And private equity goes for short-term profit maximization. Okay? So they will have no qualms about depleting resources as quickly as possible, maximizing profits, loading up a sector with debt, declaring bankruptcy, moving out. So finance is a prescription which is creating more and more economic stability, instability and at the same time depleting nature and depleting the commons and enriching the plutocracy. So it's in a very important combination of circumstances. Yeah, uh, and the global financial crisis, I think, has been the most apparent instance of this short-sightedness. And afterwards, the banking system has been through a series of improvements, such as the higher capital requirements uh, or increased supervision. Um, do you think those improvements are not enough? Uh, they're, they're sort of pathetic, uh, because the fact is that the financial corporations are completely dominating uh, the world. If you think of a situation where one company 
one company owns, in effect, 20% of the world's stocks. One company. That's BlackRock. And BlackRock has an algorithm-driven system called Aladdin. And it manipulates the price of stocks, shares, all over the world. Okay? And when I say 20%, probably by today it's more like 22%. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's growing uh, rapidly. Now, you have a situation where these plutocrats in Wall Street are making billions and billions from financial transactions. We no longer have shareholder capitalism. We have share-dealing cap capitalism. It used to be that the average share in a corporation was held for seven years. Okay? So you had, if those of you who are ec economists will know what I'm talking about, you had an, a genuine situation of principals, the shareholders, holding the agents, the managers, to a long-term perspective. So a manager would normally want to maximize short-term profits because mm -hmm. he wants to go off to his retirement home and take his millions, mm -hmm. right? But the shareholders were meant to hold the, the managers to a long-term preservation of that company and the traditions, etc. We now have a situation where the average share is held for less than seven months. And many shares change hands daily, okay, millions. So you have a situation where the financiers, they, they want to maximize short-term profits, load up the company with debt, move out. Move in, move out, take your profits. And this, of course, is me turned corporations, companies, into commodities. You just buy and sell them. Buy them for their intellectual property rights, sell them next day. And it, it's created more and more of this uncertainty that, that I've been writing about. So the nature of, of this capitalism has profoundly changed in the last 50 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And touching on this uncertainty, it seems like the precariat is a direct consequence of this globalizing neoliberal system, the way you describe it. And you coined this very term, precariat. What would you say are the main characteristics of the social class? I always, I always have to say, do you want a, a short answer for an MA thesis or a long answer for a PhD on, on this question? Um, I wrote this book called The Precariat in 2011, and it's changed my life because it's gone into 25 languages. It's led to me be invited to talk about it in 700 places in 42 countries. It's been translated in 27, 25 languages and about to come out 26. So it's transformed my life. And what I've seen is when I've given talks, whether it's in China, it's in the United States, in Tokyo, in South Africa, in, in any number of countries, the same phenomenon is found. The precariat can be defined in, in three dimensions. I, I cannot tell you how many people have misquoted my, my book and the books in general, But the three dimensions are, if you use a Marxist uh, terminology, distinct relations of production, first of all. People in the precariat are living unstable lives, unstable labor. They have no occupational narrative to give to their life. They don't feel they're going anywhere. They tend to have a level of education that is higher than the level of labor they're expected to perform, and they have to do a lot of work for labor, work for the state that doesn't get counted, doesn't get remunerated, doesn't get counted in our statistics. But if you're in the precariat, you have to do a lot mm -hmm. of that work. That's the first dimension. That's the dimension that most journalists and others mention more than any other, if not the only one. For me, it's the least important of the three dimensions. The second dimension is that if you're in the precariat, you have distinctive relations of distribution. And what that means in plain parlance is you are paid money wages. You don't get non-wage benefits. 
You don't get paid holidays. You don't get medical insurance. You don't get the prospect of a pension. You don't get uh, enterprise benefits like what I call pleasure, you know, corporatized leisure and things like that. And at the same time, you are exploited off workplaces, outside labor time, and most importantly, you are living on the edge of unsustainable debt. One mistake, one accident, one illness, you're out in the streets. And you are faced with chronic economic uncertainty, which we'll come back to because it's a very different thing from insecurity. And that's why basic income becomes a relevant issue. We'll come back to that. The third, the third dimension is distinctive relations to the state. This is the first time in history when the growing mass class in society is losing the rights of citizenship. They're losing civil rights, access to due process, ability to defend themselves before the law. They're losing cultural rights. We cannot feel that they can practice within their communities. They're losing economic rights. They cannot practice what they're trained to be able to do and aspire to be able. And they're losing political rights because they look across the political spectrum. And what do they find? The new right? No. The new, what is, what is new? You have the old social democrats who are dead men walking. You have a rejection of laborism, often by the precariat, because they don't suffer the false consciousness of thinking their job is the most important thing in life. Right? That's a sense of freedom. If you think about it, my job, I do my job. It's an instrumental issue. But don't tell me I've got to be happy in my job. I mean, please. So losing the rights leads to the most important thing that anybody in the precariat knows. They feel like a supplicant. They feel like they have to rely on favors done to, for them. They have to rely on a bureaucrat making a discretionary judgment that they are entitled to a benefit. They have to rely on a discretionary judgment of an employer. They have to rely on a discretionary judgment of other people. This is a sense of being a supplicant. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's been in that situation will know that it's, it's humiliating. It's a loss of dignity, a loss of a feeling that you belong. Yeah. Right, And it leads to many of the things that, that people in the precariat experience. Stress, mental ill health, suicidal tendencies, deaths of despair. The, the data are there. If you subject people to this sort of existence, these symptoms, these morbid symptoms, as Gramsci might call them, emerge. And then some of them turn to the far right, the Wilders, the Farages, or whatever, and you get a, a cumulative uh, set of problems yeah, from that. On that note, um, all of that, what you mentioned, you know, is um, kind of portraying the precariat's uh, vulnerability to populism, to this discontent and instability. And, you know, this channels a force for creating this political monster, one that would offer them simplistic solutions and one that also increases polarization. Would you say that Donald Trump is the embodiment of that political monster? Well, on, on page one of the Precariat, <laughs> uh, written in 2011, remember, early 2011 it came out, I said, unless the insecurities and aspirations of the Precariat are addressed by per politics, we will see the emergence of a political monster. Those were the exact words. And I had the dubious uh, pleasure that a few months after the book came out, there were riots in London, some of you may, may remember, in 2011, in Tottenham they began. And a lot of people equated my book and the riots. It had nothing to do with the riots, absolutely nothing. But there was a play put on in London called The Precariat, juxtaposing me giving a talk about, unless you address it, we're going to see a politics of inferno, 
and burning cars in London. And in, in Poland, there was a big newspaper yes. with the picture of me and a picture of burning cars. So it looked as if I had something to do with the burning cars. But in early 2016, I had the dubious pleasure, you may want to leave now before you hear this, or you may want to throw something at me uh, after I've told this story. But I had the dubious pleasure of being asked by the Bilderberg Group to go and address them uh, in Bremen, in a castle outside Bremen. And I thought it was a lefty friend of mine pulling my leg, as we say, and I took no notice. So I thought, who would it write to me asking me to... Because the Bilderberg Group, as those of you who don't know, is the far-right group of elite people, powerful people. And I thought, took no notice. Then two days later, I got a phone call uh, saying, no, we, we want you to come and address. So imagine me going to this castle and having to give uh, a talk to a smaller number than here this afternoon. And right in the front was Henry Kissinger. And then Christine Lagarde. And then the head of NATO. And then the, 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 your prime minister, he was there. Uh, Rutte, and he asked to talk to me afterwards. And I thought they'd all rush for the bar, me talking about the precariat and basic income and things like that. They all sat there and they put up their, you know, their number plate wanting to ask questions. I was very surprised. And I said, do not be surprised. It's on, it's on record what I'm about to say. Do not be surprised if later this year we see Brexit in Britain and Donald Trump being elected. Because nobody is addressing the growing precariat. And part of the problem we have with the precariat is it's a class in the making, another Marxian term. A class in the making is a class that knows what it's against, but does not know what it's for yet. It's split. And it's split in three factions. One I call the atavists. These are the relatively uneducated. They haven't been to the University of Amsterdam, for example. They feel they've lost yesterday. And they want yesterday back. It's an imaginary yesterday, right? They are reactionaries. These are the people who support the Orbans, the Wilders, the Trumps, the Farages, the Maloneys, right? These are the frightening ones. The second group... I call them nostalgics. They're the migrants, the vulnerables, the disabled. They can't afford to take action. They won't vote for the far right, but they keep their heads down. They keep their heads down, right? Until there are days of, of rage, like I saw in Stockholm, for example, mm -hmm. that situation. And then the third part are the progressives. These are the young, many, a majority of women, who go to university, they learn that there is no future. Where is the politics of the future? Where are the political movements saying, we are going to have a transformation in a better society, a more convivial society, a more nature-driven society, a more egalitarian society? Where is that? Yeah. And that's why we have a crisis, because... We had a Trump. I'm confident enough he's going to be beaten this year because he's such a, a fool. But there'll be another one waiting in the wings. But that's where we, we are in a political crisis. And on the topic uh, of the future, and exactly, you know, this nature-driven future, um, we cannot talk about this, these current socioeconomic structures without discussing their fatal impact on our environment. According to you, is uh, sustainability incompatible with capitalist growth? Well, I think we have to move away from this, this fetish of GDP growth for a start. I've written a book called Politics of Time, which has just come out. And, and I, I've said that we have lost the capacity, no, when I say we, I mean society, has lost the capacity to appreciate nature and appreciate time, okay? And we have a situation now where nature is being depleted, 
we are losing the capacity to care for each other. And GDP is a concept which was invented in the 1930s by an economist called Simon Kuznets. Some of you may know this. And it was a concept for the resources mobilizable for war. Okay, that was the GDP, was, that was the measure. It was, these are the resources, this is a measure of resources mobilizable for the Second World War. All right? So they made the decision, this bunch of male statisticians around Simon Kuznets, that women with children are non-mobilizable for war. Well, and therefore they gave care work a value of zero. Okay? And then not only care in the sense of caring for children, caring for the community, caring for ourselves, caring for the future of our education. The whole idea of care was completely dismissed. And in the book I show that, that we still have this sexually stupid concept of GDP, which is purely sexist, and there are government estimates. My own government has Office of National Statistics. They've done estimates of the value of unpaid care. Okay? It comes to 900 billion pounds, okay? Which is about 50% of the money economy. Now, if you gave an imputed value to the care we give to our elderly, to the children, to the community, you would that massively increase measured national income, right? You would massively increase growth. But we have a crazy situation that if I stop looking after my elderly mother and take a job, national income goes up, right? If I stop doing a job and I look after my elderly mother, National income goes down and jobs go down and the politicians are unhappy. This is, if a Martian came down and to visit, he would think we're mad, right? So we need to reconceptualize what it is we want as society. And getting away from GDP, I don't like the term degrowth. I don't feel comfortable with it because some people interpret that as lowering income standards for the poor, which is not what is meant, yeah. right? But we have to recalibrate what we want as the future. Yeah, and one of the um, concepts you, you discuss is co-management. Um, so it means that commoners govern their commons and you have a shift from a, uh, from a shareholder to a stakeholder approach. Uh, could this be the solution to our natural resource crisis? Well, it's the first question I haven't felt quite comfortable with your wording, but, yes. but leave it, leave it, don't worry. The, the essence of what I'm arguing is that historically, people wanted to be commoners. Historically, the difference between labor and work was, was clear. The difference between recreation and leisure was clear. The importance of urgia, idleness was there. And the importance of commoning was uh, sort of very important historically. And the most subversive constitutional document in British history, but also, I believe, in international history, came in 1217. And 1217 was the year, on November the 6th, the two do constitutional documents that had defined democracy ever since were sealed in Westminster Cathedral in front of a 10-year-old king. First was Magna Carta, which was all about civil rights and, and legal rights and rights. And the second was, alongside it, was regarded as equally as important, if not more so, was the Charter of the Forest. And what the Charter of the Forest did was said that everybody has the right to subsistence, Everybody has the right to common. Everybody has the right to access the commons. And the commons are what belong to all of us. Okay? And they were defined as commons in the Justinian Codex of AD 529, 
as one of the four forms of property. Okay? So throughout history, people have been struggling to retain or recover the commons. And the commons are not just land. They're not just land and the sea. They are also our educational institutions. There are our legal institutions, the, the culture and the institution. They are things that belong to all of us. But in the neoliberal age and under rentier capitalism, we've seen a plunder of the commons a privatization, a commodification, a financialization. And that the irony is that if you convert a public park, for example, this wonderful uh, commons forest outside Amsterdam, the name I can never pronounce, but it's a beautiful concept, but we have similar things. If you privatize that, you raise GDP. You raise growth. The politicians can say we've raised growth but you've depleted an informal form of social protection, mm -hmm. an informal form of social solidarity. And this has been happening all over the world. And the commons is something unites unites us. And it's something that historically we've valued. And we must recover it. And that's, that's basically a theme of the, of the work. Yeah. And in your critique of the global economic system, you also describe global finance pushing local communities in developing countries to become export-oriented production zones. Do you classify this as neocolonialism? Yeah, I would also call it neo-mercantilism in the sense that what we've seen is the World Bank, the IMF, all the big financial corporations like Blackstone and BlackRock and Carlyle and so on, liberally accelerating the privatization of vast swathes of developing countries. And this is causing distress out-migration, causing refugees, economic refugees. And of course, this is all coming up into Europe, into the United States, into rich countries. But we are responsible. And I say we, I don't mean us, but, but the rich countries' governments are responsible for allowing and encouraging this financialization and privatization. And it's particularly affected, I've worked a lot in Africa, all the coastal communities who've had their fishing grounds converted into something owned by big conglomerates from the richest countries. So we, 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 that is a, a really crucial area, and it's part of neo-mercantilism. And when you have a crisis in a global tra a transformation, what happens is that the leading countries that are under pressure, in this case the United States, become more and more neo-mercantilist. They put up barriers to other countries. They put up protectionist barriers. They're, in this case, it's discriminating against China. Not allowed to have electric cars from China, etc. You put up barriers to the rising state because you are the declining. And that leads to tensions, and we saw what happened in the 30s, and I think it's in, we're in danger of seeing that again. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so I think now would actually be a perfect time to open ourselves up and our guests to some questions from the audience, if there are any. Good. Yes, back there. We have a microphone. Uh, you can yeah. wait for a second and then... Hi, uh, thank you for speaking here. It's really an honor to hear you talk about your book. But I wanted to ask you about um, Kamala Harris and what she's saying about greedflation and the measures uh, um, in, in terms of price ceilings she's talking about. And I'm just really curious what you think about it. About what, sorry? Uh, Kamala Harris's uh, policies on price ceilings that she's talking about imposing if she were to be elected? I, I, my, I mean, I, I think most of us in this room hope she wins the, the presidential election, so don't mistake what I'm about to say. I think she will continue what's called Bidenomics. And I think Bidenomics is about protectionism, it's about subsidies to corporations, trying to bring back jobs to manufacturing, 
and they will try and control prices. But I don't think it's going to alter the structure, don't think it's going to alter the geopolitical tensions that I've just mentioned, and I don't think it's going to lead to what is really needed in the global system. And what is really needed above all is economic security for ordinary people. And unless we have a strategy for that, we don't have a politically feasible strategy at all. So you don't think that controlling greedflation with price ceilings is going to ease consumers? I don't think so, because it will lead to all sorts of fudging, a lot of subsidies, a lot more uh, inefficiencies. Uh, I don't think it will stop the growth of the Chinese economy, but it will get more and more expensive and other countries will have to follow suit. And if other countries can't do it, then we in Europe, for example, are going to lose out to the United States, but meanwhile, China will continue to grow as the, the dominant rentier state. So, I mean, I think it will have a small effect, but not really much. Okay, so uh, getting to work on universal basic income, you hope that that is the right way to go. And uh, you imply that globalization might spread the economic uh, insecurity on a global scale. In many countries, we have a welfare system that specifically targets what you call also the precariat. However, you are rather a proponent of the UBI. How does this represent a more sustainable solution to the socioeconomic situation? Well, first of all, I actually never use the term UBI or universal basic income. I always use the term basic income. I believe that this era as a result of rentier capitalism, the AI technological revolution, and the geopolitical developments around that, has created an era of chronic uncertainty. Now, for an economist, uncertainty is not like risk or classic idiosyncratic insecurity. The welfare state was built at a period of industrial time, okay? So it was reasonably uh, okay, in a utilitarian way, for tying benefits, either through the Bismarckian system or the beverage system, or some variant, the Swedish model, to the performance of labor. You know, you had a risk of unemployment, you had a risk of, of illness, you had a risk of maternity or whatever, and you could work out the probabilities and you could have a social security system designed to respond to the probabilities, an actuarial risk situation. Today, we don't have that particular world. We have a period, an era of tertiary time, which I call in, in the book, where the boundaries between activities are breaking down. You have a lot of insecurities that are outside labor, and you have chronic uncertainty, which means unknown unknowns. And unknown unknowns means that any of us could be hit by a shock or a costly hazard that we can't predict and we can't insure for. Because unknown unknowns, is, you can't insure for that. And we've seen six pandemics this century already. We've seen financial crises cr crashing around. We have nothing to do with those, right? We have a whole set of insecurities, including stress, mental ill health, and so on. And that old system of laborism has broken down, okay? There are a huge, I've just done a program for Arte, uh, Working But Poor. Huge millions of people can work their socks off. They can work 60 hours a week, and they don't get any income security as a result neither adequacy or in terms of security and stability. We can give them numerous other things, and it's the image of a black swan. Wonderful book called The Black Swan by Talib. But it's not just an occasional black swan, it's bevies of them. They're coming at us all the time, right? In those circumstances, you need ex-ante social protection, not ex-post compensation. You need to give people a sense I know tomorrow morning I will be able to wake up and I have my food. 
and the next morning. And I know my neighbors must have that sense. So for me, this is adding a new imperative to the case for a basic income. Mm -hmm. I believe in a basic income because it's common justice. The people who are taking our commons and making profit from our commons should be compensating the commoners who are losing. Okay? The million, the billions that Bill Gates and the others are making are make, taking from our commons. Yeah, so on this topic of UBI being a matter of justice and BI, freedom. BI, BI sorry. Um, BI being a matter of justice and freedom, what's also connected to freedom, right, as you're seeing, is the way that one chooses to spend their time, which, as you discuss in your book, The Politics of Time, is an inherently political thing. So then would you say that, let's be honest, is UBI an economically justified tool or rather an ethically justified mechanism? I believe it's both, okay? Mm -hmm. But I think it's most important for those of us who support moving in this direction, and notice the term I use, moving in the direction of everybody having a basic income, adequate uh, to, to survive on, right? Moving in that direction. I believe that fundamentally it has to be an ethical rationale. It's a matter of common justice, as I've just said. The income and wealth of every single one of us is far more to do with the efforts and achievements of the many generations before us, correct or not, than anything we do ourselves. And if you believe in private inheritance or accept private inheritance of private wealth, then we should accept public inheritance of publicly created wealth. So that for me is the first. And I'm very pleased to see that I'm not a Catholic, I'm not a... I'm not a a religious person at all, but I'm glad to see that Pope Francis has come out arguing for that line, okay? The common heritage of humanity. But the second reason is, second ethical reason is it enhances freedom. The freedom to say no to an abusive relationship, for example. The freedom to make choices, but most importantly, the Republican freedom of being able to look at other people as an equal, I don't have to be a supplicant. I know my bread, my butter, my rent is covered. I'm your equal. That is a very important freedom. And that freedom goes with a sense, the third ethical reason. Everybody deserves to have basic security in life. If you are chronically insecure, as the psychologists have taught us, your mental bandwidth shrinks, your IQ drops, your capacity to make rational decisions drops. If that's the case, it's unfair of the politicians to hold you responsible for all your actions because your circumstances have diminished your mental capacities. Mm -hmm. And for me, basic security is a human need. Everybody wants basic security. Not total security, but basic security. So for me, those ethical reasons, and then you get to the economic reasons. Instrumental, lowering poverty, lowering inequality. Uh, very importantly, the ecological rationale. Okay? The beauty of our experiments that we've seen with basic income is that people spend more of their time on care, more of their time on allotments, more on their time in linking with nature, environmental activities, NGOs. That is wonderfully liberating. You could call it instrumental, or you can call it part of the ethical rationale. But for me, it all comes together. And now we have one additional factor. Basically insecure people tend to vote for extremists. And if we have the continuation of the trend to populism and neo-fascism, we can all go home because that is what's happening. All right? Whether it's Wilders here or Farage in Britain or Trump or Maloney or Orban or Putin's, people who are chronically insecure tend to vote for people like that. That's one imperative that we need to make sure everybody has security. So just They become better people. 
So uh, you have accompanied many pilot projects, and right now we see a deepening of social uh, divisions. How do you see the BI then impacting this polarization of society? Does it have a positive impact? Well, you're listening to a sad man who has had the opportunity, or whatever, to be able to put into practice what he's believed for many years, ever since Alexander here and I first formed a bien together. And I've had the chance to do pilots and be involved in pilots. At the moment, there are something like 200 basic income experiments. I don't call them pilots because they don't quite, most of them don't fit the ideal model of a basic income pilot. But we have done genuine pilots where we've given every man, every woman, every child in communities a basic income for a couple of years. Done it in India, in Africa, the United States, just finished a pilot in Wales with care, care leavers and so on. And I can tell you that in every single experiment that I've seen, regardless of the level of country or the income, the first and most important thing you see is an improvement in mental health. An improvement in mental relaxation, a reduction of stress, a reduction of long-term illness probabilities that come from mental ill health mm -hmm. and stress. And I think that's something that is universal. The second thing we've seen is that it improves the nutrition and the schooling of children. Partly, it turns out, not just because there's more food, but because the family is more relaxed. The background of the children is more relaxed. And there was an experiment in North Carolina, which is an I call it the accidental pilot, because mm -hmm. it started with giving out basic income, but at the, coincidentally, a local university was starting a longitudinal study of child development in the same communities. Mm -hmm. It was pure coincidence. And at the end of 16 years, the children who had been in families receiving the basic income were approximately one year ahead in school compared, on average, compared with the children who had not been receiving the basic income. So we've seen that. We've seen an improvement in women's status, improvement in the status of people with disabilities. And I'll give you three examples of the first of those. A number of experiments have shown that when women have a basic income, those who are in abusive relationships walk out of them. That's freedom. We had an experiment in Africa, and at the end of the two years, I was visiting the villages, and I called several teenage women across, and I said, what's, what's been the best thing for you? having a basic income, the best thing. And they were timid teenagers, had their new T-shirts and things, and I was a foreigner, you know, white man from far away, and they did start with, they didn't want to give me an answer. And then one of them plucked up courage, and she turned to me and she said, I'll tell you, the best thing. When the men used to come down from the fields at the end of the month with their wages, we had to say yes. Now we can say no. That's freedom. That's freedom. So for me, that's an important part, to see this exercise of freedom. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, slowly coming to an end already, it's been so quick. <laughs> in your book, The Precariat, you acknowledge that the neoliberals were partly right in diagnosing the welfare state as inefficient and rigid, and still you maintain that their resulting prognosis was callous. If the socioeconomic system continues in the current direction, what do you foresee for the future? Well, in a sense, that's the answer I've been giving the last... 50 minutes yeah. or whatever. Um, because I think if we see a continuation um, of what's happening, the trend, one area we haven't talked about is the 
the corruption of education, the fact that human capital and egotistical learning has replaced the pursuit of morality and truth and, and liberal values, I think we're going to see a, a dark night, okay? I don't think we are mad enough to repeat the 1930s and adrift to it, but we're coming dangerously close. You know, if we get a situation where we demonize large parts of humanity, where things like the Gaza mon uh, genocide is somehow pushed aside as a breaking of all the values of the Geneva Conventions and things, but it's, it's accepted. Some of us protest, but it's still happening, right? And many other symptoms, the morbid symptoms. The old is dying, but the young, the new isn't yet to be ready. I think your job, our job, is to demand a transformation, a demand that re requires an ecological perspective, a revival of the future that's different from more and more consumption, different from accepting that the precariat is wallowing in, in insecurity and in vulnerability, but the middle classes can go on, you know, have their mortgages mm -hmm. and their fine consumption, and we, we accept that. We can't. We can't. And every one of us has a responsibility to oppose the trends that we're watching. I cannot emphasize that strong, strongly enough because we are in a crisis moment. Your parliament is opening today. You have a new composition, new composition with a man prominent who a few years ago most of us would have regarded as totally unacceptable. But I'm not smug because we've got our equivalents and we're seeing it elsewhere. So for me, it's, a, it's an existential crisis, a poly-crisis, most fundamentally the ecological crisis, but also a social crisis. Suicide rates among young women have been shooting up all over the world. It comes from insecurities. And I think that we need to build an optimistic, forward-looking strategy. And that's why I think reviving the commons, giving people basic security, building associational freedom, better democracy, deliberative democracy, all of them come together. And how do you see the values that would underline this transformation reconciling with the you know, values underlining our systems and structures today? Well, I think they have to be dismantled. I mean, uh, with, with the remember, I've written this book called The Corruption of Capitalism. I wanted to call it rentier capitalism, and the publisher said, nobody will understand rentier capitalism. But um, basically, we need to dis dismantle the financial dominance. We need to dismantle the subsidy state. It's not appreciated how much uh, the, the state is subsidizing capital and subsidizing the wealthy. We need to dismantle the debt mechanism. Finance wants everybody to be in debt. They want people to be in debt. That's where they make their money. So stop thinking, you know, we should stop thinking, that, oh dear, it will be solved. They want people to be in debt. So we have to dethrone the power of finance. How we do that, there are various, there are various ways. And most fundamentally, we need to dismantle the intellectual property rights system. Okay? When I say we haven't got a free market, in 1994, TRIPS was uh, put into legislation. And TRIPS is the trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. And essentially what it did, it globalized the US intellectual property rights system. So nowadays, we have a system where there are 16 million patents in force at any one time. A patent gives the owner of the patent 20 years monopoly profits where nobody can compete with them. They've got that as a, a property. And the, the plutocratic corporations, the big tech, big pharma, etc., they buy up all these patents, string them together, and make their billions. Okay? So we need to dismantle that. It doesn't, it doesn't help with growth. It doesn't help with innovation. 
It certainly doesn't help with, with security for people. And with AI coming, AI is going to make that system even more so because they own the patents. Mm -hmm. So it's, we, need to, we need to dismantle rentier capitalism in general. How do you say um, BI plays in with this you know, rising influence of AI? I've had a victory. I've had a victory. <laughs> BI, good. Uh, <laughs> I, I think BI is absolutely in lock with the AI revolution. Uh, I, I can't claim any credit for what I'm about to say, so please don't think I'm doing so. But I had a discussion with Sam Altman in 2016. Sam Altman is the, the guru of, of AI. And uh, he is now converted to basic income. As I said, I can't claim credit, but he is supporting basic income. And a lot of the people in Silicon Valley are supporting basic income for the wrong reason. But I don't mind what reason. As long as they put their money in it and their support for it, uh, we, will, we will do better. And Chris Hughes, the co-founder of Facebook, is also a convert, and he's putting millions and millions of dollars into these experiments around the world. Mm -hmm. So AI is disruptive. It's going to increase inequality. And that's another reason why we need yeah. a basic income. OK, uh, I think thank you so much, Mr. Guy Standing. Um, I hope it was for, for this conversation and for being our guest today. We really enjoyed it. And let's have a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you enjoy the interviews and would like to steal our jobs, the applications to our committees are open. And for this reason, we are also hosting an info barrel today at 6 at Krater. So pop in if you're interested. Yeah, and if you can't get enough of our interviews, this Friday we're hosting Mrs. Hanny Verbe kusters She's the head of the Financial Intelligence Unit. And that interview is going to take place this Friday. That's the 20th at 1 p.m. as well here on our couches in the E-Hall. So make sure to join. And Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank yeah. you so much. Well done.